of On the Road to Pentecost. Uh, good evening. I'm Father Brian Christensen, uh, broadcasting high above the cathedral at 520 Cathedral Drive here in Rapid City. Um, I'm going to calm down our background a little bit. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. Oh, there, that's a nice background tonight. How about that one? Let's do that tonight. Um, yeah, so uh, once again, I want to welcome you to this Wednesday night on the road to Pentecost. It's been great being with you uh, during these weeks of the Easter season. Uh, we're closing in uh, this Sunday on the celebration of Pentecost uh, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles, uh, Mary, on um, the other followers uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and it was the birthday of the church. And so um, in preparation for that, I want to take us back to the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and I want to go to that very uh, moment of the Pentecost and the immediate time afterwards um, when um, uh, Peter began to preach and proclaim the good news and the joy of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. So join me in prayer tonight in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. There there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. The crowd was astonished and bewildered and said to one another, what does this mean? But others said, scoffing, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to my words. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. You who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed, using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. But since he was the prophet and knew what God had sworn an oath to him and that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. Of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured it forth, as you both see and hear. For David did not go up into the heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter and the other apostles, what are we to do, my brothers? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That day, 3,000 were baptized. Loving God and Father, in this Easter season, you draw us ever closer to yourself. You renew within us our baptismal call and the graces first received in baptism, the graces of faith and hope and love. Guide us tonight. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may live out our baptismal graces and our mission to serve you and to serve our brothers and sisters, to love you and to love others. Strengthen us in virtue and in holiness. Draw us ever closer to yourself in that great Paschal mystery, the death and glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we live in the light of Christ and live in the joy of the gospel and share that joy with all 
our brothers and sisters, especially those who feel most alienated, most isolated, most alone, anxious, or afraid, that the relationship with you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may give them confidence, peace, and joy in every fruit of the Spirit. Bless us tonight and guide us as we seek to know and to love you above all things. We ask all of these things through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it is uh, great to be with you. And uh, as we hear in this um, gospel passage, really the Acts of the Apostles, um, from the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, we hear about the Pentecost, how Jesus had promised to his disciples that he would send them the spirit of all truth, that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and they would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. They would receive power when the Holy Spirit um, came upon them, and they would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Jesus also promises to them that he would be with them always until the end of the age. And that promise is for each and every Christian. That's the, all of us who have been baptized uh, in Christ um, have received this same Holy Spirit that unites us as one body in Christ uh, and calls us and empowers us uh, to be witnesses uh, of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, what Peter gives us in, in this first um, speech, this first homily, this first sermon, if you will, after Pentecost, uh, is really the heart uh, of what we call the kerygma. Uh, the kerygma is um, a Greek term that means proclamation. So this is the heart uh, of the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and what is at the heart of this kerygma? What does the kerygma express? Well, um, I, if you remember, I hope you were with us on the second week that we had on the road to Pentecost, we had a Father John Ricardo. And Father John Ricardo um, is part of a movement uh, called Acts 29. Now, if you know the Acts of the Apostles, there's only 28 chapters. It ends with Paul's imprisonment in Rome, um, where he spends two years leading up uh, to his death, where he's beheaded and buried there in Rome. Um, but <clears throat> Father John Ricardo, by calling his movement Acts 29, um, really is challenging each and every one of us today that we, with our lives, the life of the church today, um, our life within our dioceses, within our parishes, um, within our own homes, um, within our own hearts, right, um, that we're called to write this next chapter uh, of the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 29. And how do we do that? One, we have to know uh, fully the kerygma, this proclamation of the good news of the gospel. We have to experience it um, like those first disciples did, that power of the Holy Spirit that moves us to a deeper understanding of Jesus Christ, um, who God is, that Jesus reveals who God is, and who we are, because Jesus reveals who we are. He's true God, and he's true man. And, and in understanding that relationship, right, then we can come to know our identity, beloved sons and daughters of our Heavenly Fathers, brothers and sisters in Christ, temples of the Holy Spirit, um, this body of Christ. And by knowing the relationship that we have with God um, and our identity, then, then we also come to know our mission, beloved sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father, disciples of Jesus Christ, temples of the Holy Spirit, who share this new life that we have received uh, in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we go out and to live this kerygma, we live the proclamation of the gospel. So Father John Ricardo in saying that as we write this um, 29th chapter of Acts of the Apostles said, what's the heart of the kerygma or what does the kerygma express? Well, first he says it expresses that we were created, created by God, created by God out of love. We see that unfold in Genesis so beautifully as he creates the whole universe, everything. And, and then he creates as the pinnacle as the heart and the center, the very reason for his creation, he creates the human person, Adam and Eve, made in his image and likeness, in the divine image, to share in his life with them. But then he says that after the first part of being created, um, we became captured. That The enemy came and captured us, took us away from that relationship with God, the, our knowing our identity and our mission of living in the life and the love of God. And so through original sin, we're captured. 
we were put in bondage of sin and death. Um, and so we live this life of frustration. And then he says, Father John Ricardo, in the charisma that as he presents it so wonderfully, we're created, uh, we were captured, and then we were rescued. Jesus comes to save us, right? He's the savior. He comes to rescue us. Because we are in darkness, imprisoned in our sinful ways, and that leads to death. It leads to a, a living death, as many of us know, of all of us know, right? Our sin isolates us from our relationship with God. Therefore, we don't know our true identity as beloved sons and daughters. And therefore, we can't live our mission and the joy of the life of, of Christ. Um, and so Jesus comes to rescue us from our sin, from our slavery to sin, and set us free to enter back into that beautiful relationship with the Heavenly Father, and that we would know that dignity that is ours in Christ Jesus. So we're created, we're captured by the enemy, and we're rescued by Jesus Christ. Now, this is what Paul, that Peter proclaims in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, immediately after the Pentecost, after the descent of the Holy Spirit. He and the other apostles are filled with great zeal and desire and joy. People think they're drunk, right? These people, have, these men have had too much wine. No, 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 it's only nine in the morning. It's only nine in the morning. We haven't had too much to drink. It's the Holy Spirit. This is what we have received, and this is what we proclaim to you, that, um, that we were dead. We were captured. And now we have been rescued and saved by Jesus Christ. And then the people ask Peter, you know, they're cut to the heart with this beautiful message. They know it. They know the power of sin and death in their lives. They know the isolation and the fear and the anxiety that comes from living I mean, in this dark, dark world. And so they say, what are we to do? What are we to do? And Peter says to them, repent, right? Repent. Turn away from sin, turn away from the darkness, and be baptized into Christ Jesus. Be immersed into the life of Christ Jesus. And that day, 3,000 are added to their number. 3,000 are baptized. 3,000 are rescued and set free. This is their response. The response, and that's the fourth part of Father John Ricardo's beautiful presentation of the Acts 29, is the kerygma is our cre being created, being captured, being rescued, and then responding to that rescue. How are we going to live the rest of our lives now that we have been snatched from the jaws of death to live eternal life? How are we going to live that life in gratitude, in thanksgiving, in relationship to God, in joyful celebration that this day has been given to us by the Lord. Every day is a new day in Christ, that we bear the light of Christ, we bear the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives, and this is, this is the joy of the gospel. This is the joy of the charisma. This is the joy of the proclamation that we bear witness to every day. We have received um, power, because the Holy Spirit has descended upon us, and we are the witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Amen? Alleluia. Ah, so good to be with you. So good to share these beautiful uh, scripture passages and be renewed in our faith. Be renewed in our faith in these days of Easter as we uh, make our way towards Pentecost. Um, we're getting ready uh, to welcome Father Leo Padalinghug uh, to uh, on the road to Pentecost. Um, Father Leo is uh, a priest of a religious institute. Now we'll ask him a little bit about that, um, about his Voluntas Dei, but also a little bit about his uh, unique mission and ministry in the church today, um, and the challenges that he has faced and overcome. Yeah, you know, thanks to God's good grace and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I want to. Thank Father Leo for joining us, and uh, welcome Father Leo Padaling Hug. I'm going to unmute you here. How are you doing tonight? Great. Thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it. <laughs> I have a lot of words. Oh no, it was great. It was something to. It was something fun to listen to, and brought back a lot of memories of the joy that we had when we were in seminary together. And I'm proud to say that I just got back from dinner with two of our classmates, Bishop Adam Parker, as well as Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell. So oh, I just had wonderful. dinner with them. Uh, Bishop Parker just celebrated his 20th anniversary to the priesthood. So how appropriate that we talk about the hierarchy of the church and also the unique charisms 
of the church members because well, full, full full disclosure right full disclosure father leo and i uh, spent uh, four years in seminary together and were ordained in 99 together father leo for the archdiocese of baltimore and me here at the cathedral in rapid city where we're broadcasting live tonight by the way so i'm father yes, leo it's, it's past my bedtime but hey for you father <laughs> christensen the world including me staying up later than normal you're too good. You're too good. Hey, um, by the way, just ha how's your family doing these days and all of this crazy pandemic stuff? Well, we're always a little crazy, and so we fit in perfectly. And as far as their health is concerned, praise God, knocking on wood and with hands prayed, uh, everyone is quite healthy and well. And um, we celebrate Mass together every Sunday. I'll come to their house. And at first, it was like the oddest thing in the world. We said Mass in my backyard. And Clusters of my family met in different parts of my backyard. It was quite <laughs> odd, <laughs> but you know, nothing can prevent them from getting their priest brother uh, to celebrate mass later on Sunday. So they had it good. They had it real good. Nice, nice. Oh, that's good. That's great. Would you just share a little bit about uh, your, um, your, your call to the priesthood, uh, but also your call to Voluntas Dei and explain a little bit. I think it, it is a unique calling and many people don't understand, you know, uh, the nature of a um, secular institute. So I'd be great to hear a little bit about that. So, yeah, it all started when I was in my mother's womb, truly. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I want to just make sure, even though I'm joking about it, I think parents need to start praying for their children's vocation, because that's what my mom and dad did for all of us, even when we were not even born. Because we all have a destiny. We all have a plan. We all have a part in God's beautiful theological plan. But I never really wanted to be a priest. I wanted to be a lawyer or a journalist. That's kind of what I studied in college. And it was later in college that I experienced a reversion. And I'm proud to say it. Part of my conversion was going to a place that a lot of people didn't understand at the time. It was called Medjugorje, formerly Yugoslavia, now Croatia, actually technically Bosnia, Herzegovina. And so there I experienced not any miracles. And even though I probably went thinking it would be great to see like the Blessed Mother and have visions, that's not faith, actually. That's not faith at all. That's supernatural things that can come from faith. But what I experienced was the faith of the church, which was seeing thousands of people from different languages praying mass, but all together, kind of like the Pentecost experience. I saw thousands of people going to confession and praying the rosary and doing acts of penance. So that really helped me to see that the church was way bigger than the four walls and where I sat always with my family for the hour of absolute sheer misery and pain. I didn't like church. I hated it. In fact, I told my dad, this guy is so boring. And my dad said, huh, well, if you can do a better job, then do it. That's kind of what he did. So, you know, I'm a priest because I accepted the challenge, you know. And so the one thing I don't want to do is be boring. And that's been anything but my vocation. Since I entered my vocation and said yes to God, it has been a little bit, to be honest with you, of a roller coaster, up and down, spinning around. It's far from boring. I mean, even prayer is well, not boring. Well, yeah. I mean, let's just say, like, uh, you know, a lot of people do know you, and you've been here to Rapid City, even here at the cathedral some years ago, and so people have been there. Hey, give a shout out. Mom and dad are on. My mom and dad are here tonight. Well, hello, <laughs> Mrs. Christians. Are you listening to me? This is an inside <laughs> joke, by the way, but she's going to jump on, and she's going to oh, make yeah. one mute you. I know. <laughs> We're not giving her the microphone tonight. Not tonight. We're no, but... Go ahead. But I just want to say that you, you're doing you're doing cooking. You're you're yeah. doing books. So, you're doing podcasts. You're doing yeah. amazing stuff. Just but it wasn't me. like that before. I started off really wanting just to be a good parish priest. But then I also realized that there are a lot of people who are coming to church. And I've always felt a calling to reach out to the people on the periphery and even beyond the scope. And so I realized that while I was called to the priesthood, maybe I'm called to be kind of like St. Paul who again was a, a complete exception to the rule. I mean, he killed the first Christian martyr for God's sakes. And he was a zealot for the faith and he was called to show the second part of our church. So we know the Petrine ministry is the institutional church. That's why Peter was sent to Rome because all roads lead there. And that was the hierarchical church. And St. Paul is known as the twin apostle 
of St. Peter. This is deep theology, but just know that Peter and Paul, even though they didn't know each other, they were brothers in the faith and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And as Peter was sent to Rome, Paul was sent to the periphery. And so Peter stands with the keys to lock the door and to open it. And if you don't have keys, then you got Paul with the sword. And he can do the same thing. He can keep people out or open doors with it. And so in a way, I felt called to be very much like St. Paul, to reach people in the periphery. And I met a group of people called Voluntas Dei, which means the will of God. And their whole charism as a secular institute community is to be a consecrated member in the secular world. And a lot of people are like, oh, is Father Leo even still a priest because he's secular? Well, guess what? Your pastor is a secular priest as a diocesan priest. But his calling is within the institution. Mine happens to operate outside the church's walls. And why? Because that's where God can be found as well. And I think if we realize that the secular world is not bad, but needs to be redeemed, we're going to have hopefully more vocations to the Secular Institute. Very good. No, I appreciate that because uh, and you explained it so beautifully, you know, reaching out. To, and I think we all have to have an evangelical heart from the center of the church, right? From the center of the family, from within our whole community. Tell me a little bit that uh, you uh, have a uh, plating grace, right? Plating mm -hmm. grace is uh, the part of your ministry or the heart of your ministry, maybe. Talked about the importance of how you have experienced food. Uh, and how that mixes with faith and family. So one of the things about the Secular Institutes is that we have to discern our, what are you drinking, by the way? And why don't I have anything? Oh, <laughs> gosh. All right. Anywho. Oh, oh, oh this, is, this was from previous conversations. I've got holy water, La Croix. <laughs> All right. So food, by the way. But our whole charism is to discern what God has given to us and to use that to the fullest ability. And I realized that God had given me some very unique and perhaps even odd gifts. I was a break dancer. I was a martial artist, but I also had a cooking background. And when we were in seminary on vacations, I would take cooking classes, meet with chefs. And Father Brian was privy to some of these meals. How he's still so skinny is beyond me. And for that, I hate him with a Christian love, of course. But what happened in the seminary was something that I think every person is supposed to experience. We're supposed to experience a community. And where does that happen? When we're in communion. And the best place to do that, just look at Jesus. He became food for a reason. So in the back of my mind, I kept having this thing about food as an important part of faith. Only after I was ordained and after September the 11th, 2001, where I realized that people were hungering for something deeper, people would invite me to their home for dinner. I would show up 40 minutes earlier, freak them all out, but I did it just to catch them at the reality of who they were. No airs, I helped set the table, and let's be honest, I showed up early to make sure the food tasted good. Okay, so I was there to just be part of the serving because people know priests formally, but do they know priests familiarly, like as a family member? And so, long story short, someone heard about what I was doing, he happened to be a producer, wanted to film a pilot. I said, over my resurrected body, but with the permissions of ecclesiastical authorities, we put something out. It grew and grew and grew to the point where the Food Network reached out to me after I'd written my first book called Grace Before Meals. And the Food Network put me on a competition with Iron Chef Bobby Flay and what hey. was the precursor. Hey, stop right there for just a second. Hold that thought. You're on the Food Network with Bobby Flay. Throwdown? Yeah. Throwdown Throw with, Bobby, down with Bobby Flay. Season seven. What was, the, what was the challenging, what was the dish? What was the challenging dish? Well, that's the whole thing. You know, this is, again, precursor to beat Bobby Flay. And really what he did was he challenged our specialty. And I didn't have a specialty. I studied culinary arts in Rome, so I could make some pasta. But I honestly made it up on the fly. I <laughs> took ingredients, I put it all together, and added holy water to marinate the meat and it turned into Father Leo's Funky Fusion Steak Fajita with holy guacamole and screaming sour cream. That <laughs> beat Bobby Flay, season seven. You beat one. Bobby Flay, season seven. And that exploded everything. Please know, 
I had no idea this was even going to happen. And it goes to show, if we're talking about doing God's will, you are going to find yourself in sometimes odd situations, precarious situations, in situations you don't plan. Who thinks of a cooking? Father Christensen, when we were in seminary, did I have any aspirations to have a cooking show? No, but yeah. we liked when you cooked. Yeah, because I also did the dishes, being a very good <laughs> servant that I am. But the painful part of all of this was I didn't expect it. I didn't plan it. But when I gave my life to God, I gave God all my gifts and talents. And I said, you're not going to use them. I realized breakdancing, cooking, and, and martial arts has nothing to do with the priesthood. But they do. You see, what we've got to do is if we're trying to follow the Holy Spirit, is not only understand the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to us, but how do we use it? How do we use it? And so I took all my gifts because I actually had to discern what they were. And you, folks, you got to be humble enough to admit that you've got sin, but you also have amazing gifts and unique abilities. Put that in Jesus's hands. He can turn water into wine. He can turn lemons into limoncello. He can turn, he can turn bread into his body and blood. So if you give yourself to him, he's going to lead you. And that's when I discovered this community of consecrated life. And it's taken me many years to discern it. God willing, in three years, I will be a full-fledged member of this community. And it doesn't mean that I'm here to do my own thing. No, it means that I have a great responsibility to discern God's plan, but also continue to work with the bishops and the local pastors. In other words, I have five bosses, people. Whenever I go anywhere, I'm responsible to the bishop, his delegate, the pastor, my institute superior, obviously to the will of God, but because we're a pontifical right, I got our answer to the Pope as well. So look, I got five bosses. I'm not doing my will, but it will look weird. But you know what? I'm sure the early apostles looked pretty weird. Father Christensen mentioned they look drunk for God's sakes. And so we're gonna know that if you're trying to do something for God, it's not going to always be like, yeah, we love you. Some people can't stand me, to be honest with you. <laughs> hey, the only um, way they win them over is by cooking for them. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 what's your, what would be your favorite menu? What would be your favorite meal? Interestingly enough, I don't have one. I look in your kitchen, in your cupboards, and in your refrigerator, and then I ask you a question. What are you hungry for? And it'll all be very different things depending on the person. And I find that I'm best at cooking when I can learn from their hungers and create something out of perhaps nothing. That's my style of cooking. But my go-to dishes are any Italian sauces and pastas. But then I also, because I'm Filipino, I do love Filipino food. And I fusion that all up with American food. And just for Americans, I'll add ketchup. <laughs> how awful how terrible <laughs> no not at all no no i'm not making fun of ketchup at all but you know what i mean we have we have a great filipino community here and uh we're doing a, a filipino mass which we've done uh, for a couple of years in Bungabi. coming up in june but oh we can't have any receptions because of the pandemic going on right now so we're not doing it so that i mean i love the mass love the mass heart and center of my life but a little pond sit and some Filipino food afterwards is, oh, a, yeah. real treat. is a real treat. For sure. Um, I mean, and how are they going to survive it? I, 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 how are they going to survive it? Well, we're trying to limit the number of uh, people in the choir for the Filipino choir. Good I know. Luck. Good luck. I got one. That's my pastoral responsibilities. I'll work it out. Um, you know, these are challenging days for our families and everyone who's listening on home tonight. Um, and it really was a movement of the Holy Spirit that you and I are talking tonight that we had, I wanted to reach out to our community and our faith family. We couldn't meet on Wednesdays anymore because of the COVID-19. Um, you face challenges. You travel to the ends of the earth, literally, uh, in literally. many ways. Um, how has your ministry changed and how has the Holy Spirit kind of helped you to adapt? Well, I got to tell you, Father, it has been hard on me. I mean, it has been like wind out of my sails, a kick in the stomach. It's been very difficult. But you know what? You got to adapt. I look at St. Paul. He was making his way to one town and it says, the Holy Spirit closed those doors so we had to go somewhere else. So from me formerly traveling literally about, about 250 days of the year, being out there and literally stopping, this is the first time I've spent 
this much time in my home ever. So you know, people, I designed my living area to look like a double tree hotel, just so that I can feel at home, <laughs> to be honest with you. So it's a very odd thing for me, but it's made us creative. They always say uh, crisis always breeds creativity or solutions or new ideas. And that's true. So we've been focusing on a couple things. I'd love to share it with your people. We're starting the Academy at platinggrace.com. So the Academy is simply an online community. I'm taking away a little break from social media because I'll be honest, it has gotten crazy and, and evil. And I've been kind of subject to it all because I'm a little bit of a target because I can be controversial at times. And people can, they have no trouble throwing shade my way. So I'm taking a break, but creating a community that's a little bit more peaceful where I can really talk about the stuff of faith without having interruptions and hate speech, trying to interfere, so to speak. So the academy is one thing. People can look it up. It's a lot of fun, too, because it's a place where we feed you body, mind, and spirit with masses and talk and cooking demonstrations and recipes, and you've got to be a part of it to experience it. The second thing we're doing that's going to be new is, look, I just hit 50 years old. Don't judge, all right? So, welcome. Welcome. Oh, no, listen up, older brother of mine. It's not <laughs> easy. But I turned 50 years old, and most people would buy a red Corvette. Nope, I'm buying a food truck, okay? I'll be cruising at 40 miles an hour on a highway with my food truck because I work with ex-convicts. I help them to experience formation and also with our connections, hopefully after a period of time working with us and developing all the skills necessary to be a professional, they'll be employed in other positions that can be a more full-time career opportunity so my food truck is going to be coming out, God willing, by the end of summer. Wonderful. That's great. And, and tell us again your website, where they can go. Everything you can find at platinggrace.com. And that's basically the phrase of serving, plating up the food. So platinggrace.com. Um, you, uh, you've been working with uh, um, ex-cons for a long time, several years. Mm-hmm. Um, any, any success stories that you have to share today? Or? Yeah, several actually. Well, I mean, we're still a small group, so I've only worked with like a small handful, sure. but every one of them have, first of all, experienced new cuisine because that's what we do. They've also experienced a professional kitchen uh, where they're learning how to respect each other because a kitchen is no different from a church. There needs to be hierarchy. There needs to be organization. There needs to be cooperation and a set of rules. And so they're learning those skills and they're also meeting people who they would never meet. My clientele is very different from their normal circle of friends. So they're learning how to speak publicly and to do all of the things that make a professional. And at least two of our people have been hired onto more professional job opportunities. And it's been amazing to see them kind of grow and flourish. Now what I gotta do is find more who want to work on a food truck with me. And hopefully, we'll even drive it all the way out to Rapid City, South Come on out. Now, now, Father Leo, I do, I do remember you talking about one day aspiring to have a food truck and do ministry out on the streets of America. <laughs> yes, even in Rapid <laughs> City, where it's not very rapid, and there's not a, it's not much of a city. So I would come up there okay, and- now you're going to get hate mail. Now well, this is what I'm talking about, but it's true. <laughs> aren't any rapids out there but that's another story <laughs> but the idea of having a food truck is because we tried to have a cafe mm. and again the holy spirit is very humbling at times you know i had these grand ideas having a cafe formation house you know all of these kind of supper clubs dude i didn't have the money and i didn't have the space to do it but you know my board for the table foundation which is the nonprofit group for plating grace they said, well, how about just a roaming restaurant? Because it really fits my personality. And that's a key. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to you, first of all, you got to pray. You got to have a serious prayer life and listen to God. But then you also have to have a trusted group of people who are equally prayerful and want to do God's will. And yet God will listen to them. So mm -hmm. the sensus fidelium is what it's called. The, the, the sense of the faithful people, they can help you. It was their idea. And you know what? It was like, that's actually God's idea. I'm getting a food truck and it's going to be 
I, big enough for me, big love, enough for my attitude and small enough for my body. I love, I love, I honestly, I love the way that you tell that story because just, you know, we get, we get ideas in our head and we are not doubting that they're from God and we try to pursue them. But even as you mentioned earlier, like St. Paul, like the Holy Spirit cut that off, but he didn't want you to just stop and, and lay down. No, it's, so it's easy for different... people to be discouraged. And you know what? That's one of the easiest tools. And it's a cheap tool of the devil. I like the word discouraged because, listen, it comes from the Latin dis, you know, to remove. Core, your heart, to take your heart out of you. And what does Jesus want to do, especially in the Eucharist? Because the Eucharistic miracles have all shown something very unique, that the Eucharistic species is a cut myocardic muscle. It's like a heart tissue. So literally the Eucharist is the encouragement. You know, Jesus meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto thine. And so the Eucharist staying close to it and staying close to the people of God, because that's where God wants them to be in his heart. It's a way to help you discern. And St. Paul was never discouraged. The man was beat up. He was, he was robbed. I mean, he was enslaved and imprisoned. All I've got to deal with is TSA and late planes every now and then. So I pretty much got it easy compared to him. But even then, it's so easy for me to get discouraged. And that's why I depend on the community that we're trying to build with Plain and Grace, good friends like yourself most of the times, you know? <laughs> but it's just, we've got to surround ourselves with good people. So I want to ask you a question. Where, wow. what, what are you hungering for? Where do you go to be fed? And who do you eat with? That's going to tell you a lot about who you are. Mm -hmm. No, that's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, do you have a tune in your head that you want to share with us as we leave our interview tonight? A tune in my head? What am I supposed yeah. to do? Sing for you and do your laundry as well? What no, just, si just sing tonight. All right, fine. Just we'll, sing. We'll, what do you got? What do you got in your in mind? Hey, how about Amazing Grace? And we'll just keep it. Do you do this to all your guests or are you just doing it to me? I mean, or you should have seen uh, Bishop Better sing. Ah, all right. So here we go. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, by the way, I'm not getting paid for this interview. I usually do. So. <laughs> I'll send you an go invoice. To, go to his website. <laughs> yeah, just tell, seriously, consider no, joining really. the Academy. And here's why. Because if we get enough people from South Dakota, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to come out there and I'm going to do a food event. I'm going to cook and Father Christensen's going to do the dishes. Now let's sing. No problem. Last word. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like you <laughs> and me. We're once was lost, but now we're found. Was blind, and now we see. Amen. Father Leo, so good to see you. Um, and with your we spirit. Should, we should do this more often. Yeah. <laughs> earlier, <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Earlier. Okay, you head off to bed. We're going to head off to our next segment of our On the Road to Pentecost. God bless you, and we'll be in touch. Peace. Thank you, Father Leo. God bless. <laughs> wow, what a treat to have Father Leo Pat Linghug from Plating Grace. I'm in the community of uh, Voluntas Dei, which is Latin for the will of God. Um, and really, each and every one of us is seeking to know and to follow the will of God. And I think Father Leo said it so beautifully. Um, in many ways, one, a life of prayer, a life of prayer of listening to God. So many times our life of prayer is talking. We talk too much, you know, um, but to listen, especially to the word of God in the sacred scriptures. But he also said, we need good friends, right? We need people around us that will journey with us. Just like Jesus called men and women around him that desired to be with him, and they supported one another on that journey. Um, Paul often had a great companion, whether that is Barnabas or Timothy or Titus, um, and others along the way that we need these good friends on that journey that help us to discern the Holy Spirit and the movement of God, the Voluntas Dei. So once again, thank you to Father Leo for joining us tonight. Um, I want to move over uh, to Michelle Skog uh, tonight, um, that Michelle uh, will lead us in some time of prayer and praise, um, following up on Father Leo's uh, um, amazing grace, which was amazing. Uh, so Michelle, welcome uh, this evening. Uh, good to have you uh, with us. Um, we'll uh, turn it over to you. I think, let me, uh, someone needs to unmute you somehow. There you go. Oh, you got it yourself. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, there you go, there you go. Uh, so tonight you're gonna try something a little different. Is that right? Well, it's hard to follow Father Leo there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just sing a cappella too. Because, uh, I think Zoom has a hard time keeping up with the piano. <laughs> okay, well, beautiful. Thanks for, for joining us all these weeks. Um, and uh, it's great to have you once again with us. So uh, I'll turn it over, all you. All right. Well, I loved um, how Leo talked about um, where we go to be fed. So I thought we could just kind of reflect on that together as we sing um, All Who Are Thirsty. I know a lot of you probably know this. So sing, sing along at your homes with me, All Who Are Thirsty. All who are thirsty, all who are we, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of this mercy as deep cries out to deep. We sing, come Lord Jesus, come. We sing, come Lord Jesus, come. Come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, come. We sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. We sing, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. We sing, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Just sing it to him. Holy with Pentecost just a few days away. Uh, I hope that that's your, your prayer in your heart. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Over and over. And then I'd like to just kind of, um, the, the last song for On the Road to Pentecost, uh, I sang this the first week, Send Us Your Spirit. And I just think the lyrics are beautiful. Um, so just, you know, let these lyrics sink into your soul. Lord, send us to your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. And uh, just meditate on that these next few days before Pentecost. Send us your spirit, Lord. Evening and full time. And hold us to near. Wake the morning light. Make our living bright. Shine on our darkness, O Lord. Teach us. Your wisdom, O Lord. Shadows have clouded 
have crowded our sight. Give us hearts that see, set our loving free. Heal us and help us, O Lord. Send us good summer, O Lord. Winters have chilled us, have stilled us too long. Give us love's own fire, be our true desire. Send us your spirit, O oh Thank you so much. Come Holy Spirit, send us your spirit, O oh Lord. Yeah, this is the hunger of our hearts. And this is what we feed on, right? We feed on the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. So Michelle, once again, thank you for leading us in prayer and those beautiful songs, uh, inviting us, inviting God into our hearts and our lives uh, this Pentecost. So God bless you. Thank you for sharing your gifts and your talents in these weeks on the road to Pentecost. And um, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to how we're going to do this in the future, because uh, we're going to be past Pentecost uh, this Sunday. But that doesn't mean that our reliance on God and the Holy Spirit ends. And I don't want it to be the end of our Wednesday. So uh, we'll think about it. So uh, God bless you and have a good evening. Thanks. So. Yeah, um, thanks to Father Leo Padalinga, thanks to Michelle Scove for joining us. Thanks to all of you for joining us. In just a few minutes, we're going to conclude with the litany of the Holy Spirit as we bring uh, On the Road to Pentecost to its conclusion. Uh, but I do want to invite all of you to consider um, moving forward. Uh, these Wednesday nights have been a great joy uh, for me and uh, um, for many, I think, uh, of making our way in preparation for this great celebration of the church, um, the descent of the Holy Spirit, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, really the birthday of the church, as we see in the Acts of the Apostles, as the church now takes on its, it, the grace of the Holy Spirit that guides it in the truth that Jesus had promised to share and spread the kerygma, proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth. Uh, we're the inheritance of that kerygma, we're the inheritance of that proclamation, we're inheritance of that Holy Spirit through our baptism in the life of the church. Um, and so we're continuing to write that 29th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles in our lives. But um, I'm going to put a little contest together. You guys can uh, email me or put it on our Facebook page at cathedralolph.com uh, there, um, dot org, dot org. Um, but you can email me at bchristiansen at D-I-O-R-C dot O-R-G, B Christensen at D-I-O-R-C dot O-R-G. Um, send me your name um, for next week's Wednesday. It can't be on the road to Pentecost, otherwise we'll be doing it for 52 weeks. I just wanna do it for 50 days. But uh, on the road to Pentecost, what's the new name for our Wednesday gathering? Um, send it in uh, to me at uh, B Christensen at D I O R C dot O R G, um, and uh, we'll go uh, figure that out from there. Um, thanks again for joining me uh, during these weeks. I wish you uh, a very blessed, holy, happy, and joy filled uh, Pentecost um, this Sunday or Saturday evening is the beautiful vigil of Pentecost. Here at the cathedral, we're gonna have a confirmation of one of our seventh grade um, students, uh, candidates for confirmation on Saturday evening at the seven or 5.30 mass on Saturday evening. And then on Sunday at 10.30, we have uh, three candidates, um, two catechumens and one candidate, three uh, members of our community that will be entering into the full communion with the Catholic Church, two through the waters of baptism, and uh, uh, all through uh, the sacrament, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and confirmation, uh, and all receiving their first Holy Communion at that Mass on Pentecost, 1030 this Sunday. 
All right, my brothers and sisters, let's, uh, um, let's conclude this evening with the beautiful litany uh, to the Holy Spirit. Okay, here we go. Don't touch anything. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Father, all powerful. Have mercy on us. Jesus, eternal Son of the Father, Redeemer of the world. Jesus. Spirit of the Father and the Son, boundless life of both. Thank you, Father. Holy Trinity. Hear us. Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Enter us to into our hearts. Holy Spirit, who art equal to the Father and the Son, into our hearts. promise of God the Father, have mercy on us. ray of heavenly light, have mercy on us. author of all good, have mercy on us. source of heavenly water, have mercy on us. consuming fire, have mercy on us. ardent charity, have mercy on us. spiritual unction, have mercy on us. spirit of love and truth, have mercy on us. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Have mercy on us. Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Have mercy on us. Spirit of knowledge and piety. Have mercy on us. Spirit of fear of the Lord. Have mercy on us. Spirit of grace and prayer. Have mercy on us. Spirit of peace and meekness. Have mercy on us. Spirit of modesty and innocence. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit the Comforter. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit the Sanctifier. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit who governs the church. Have mercy on us. Gift of God, the Most High. Have mercy on us. Spirit who fills the universe. Have mercy on us. Spirit of the adoption of the children of God. Have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, inspire us with the horror of sin. Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Holy Spirit, shed thy light in our souls. Holy Spirit, engrave thy law in our hearts. Holy Spirit, inflame us with the flame of thy love. Holy Spirit, open to us the treasures of thy grace. Holy Spirit, teach us to pray well. Holy Spirit, enlighten us with thy heavenly inspiration. Holy Spirit, lead us in the way of salvation. Holy Spirit, grant us the only necessary knowledge. Holy Spirit, inspire us in the practice of good. Holy Spirit, grant us the merits of all virtues. Holy Spirit, make us persevere in justice. Holy Spirit, be thou our everlasting reward. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Send us thy Holy Spirit. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Pour down into our souls the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Grant us the spirit of wisdom and piety. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful. And enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful Father, that thy divine spirit may enlighten inflame and purify us, that he may penetrate us with his heavenly dew, and make us fruitful in good works, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your, thy Son, who with thee, in the unity of the same Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, that brings us almost to the eight o'clock hour. I uh, just want to thank you all again for joining us on the road to Pentecost this evening. I want to thank Father Leo Padalinghug from Plating Grace, um, check out his website and uh, the foundation that he has. Um, it's a beautiful ministry in the life of the church. Also want to thank Michelle Skog for uh, leading us in prayer and song uh, these weeks. And also I want to thank Laura Hawk, who's been uh, hiding behind the screen, uh, doing all the technical work here at the cathedral as we broadcast live from the second floor of the Cathedral of Our Lady of Perpetual Help at 520 Cathedral Drive here in Rapid City, South Dakota. I'm Father Brian Christensen. I want to thank you for joining us for On the Road to Pentecost. Send in your recommendations for the next series starting next Wednesday. What's the name going to be? Send it to my email address, post it on our Facebook page, uh, or give a call. And we'll, uh, we'll take your uh, name suggestions and uh, put them in a hat. We'll roll the dice, and we'll have our new series beginning next Wednesday. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you go in peace. Thanks be to God. Have a great Pentecost. We'll see you at Mass.